I've been thinking about Advent for a couple of months now, and it's been hard to plan because we've been a little busy, but that's okay. Usually, when I preach, I base it on something fairly firm, my faith, my understanding of God, my understanding of love, some aspect that God has laid on my heart, some aspect of our lives that God has laid on my heart. I don't always claim to be right. I certainly don't claim to know everything, not in a million years. But rarely do I claim to have no knowledge on a topic at all, no direct knowledge. But today, I'm going to preach a little bit about something that I don't think we know very much about. We have very few details on it, and what details we have, a few of them come from Scripture, but most of them come from the 19th century. Something we have no idea when it's going to happen. And this puts us squarely in the same position that our ancient Israelite brothers and sisters were in. For the better part of 3,000 years, the people of Israel were anticipating, waiting on the chosen Messiah, the chosen one of God who would deliver them from oppression, from struggle, from hardship. Now, there are a bunch of prophecies across the Hebrew Scriptures about this, 40 at least, and they cover the entire narrative of the Hebrew Scripture. They come from Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Psalms, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Deuteronomy, Zechariah, Malachi, Hosea, Micah, 2 Samuel, and Ruth. For generation upon generation, the people of Israel waited. Now, to be clear, I've said this before. God did not leave them alone. God did not abandon them as they waited. God sent prophets, leaders, judges, even a couple of amazing kings to help the people of Israel remain faithful and to remain on the path that God had marked out for them. But the people of Israel just like us today, always seem to wander off the path. They seem to get lost in that waiting. And God continued to gently call them back, to sometimes not so gently call them back, to remind them that the Messiah was coming and would appear But they continued to wander. They would hope, they would alternate, hoping and despairing for the coming Messiah. Maybe it would never happen, they thought sometimes, I suspect. But then it did. Hope was restored. Love, forgiveness reigned. Jesus had come. This is exactly what this season of Advent is about. The season of expectant waiting, you heard me say earlier. The season of hope, of joy. We celebrate and remember Jesus' is coming. The one who opened the door to faith for us. The one who made peace with God possible. The author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus came into this world and changed everything. The coming of Jesus was and is an answer to prayer. A reason to celebrate. A reason to get excited, church. Our text today is from Matthew 24, 36 through 40. 
I want you to hear these words. I want them to touch your heart as we begin and enter into this season of waiting. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only God. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the, at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, making merry, and giving into marriage, up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. This is how it will be with the Son of Man. Two men will enter the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding at a handmill, one taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house knew what time of night the thief would come, he would set a watch and would not let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. May the Word of God be a blessing to you today. May it light your way into this first week of Advent. May it speak to you. Last week, I taught the Boomer Sunday School class and I told them that I have questions. And that may be a little presumptuous. I admit that. But I have questions I'm dying to ask Jesus. I have questions I'm dying to ask those first disciples, Paul and other great fathers of faith before us. Now, I willingly acknowledge that on the day I walk through heaven's gates, I'm probably not going to care anymore about those questions. And that's okay. But sitting here today, standing here today, or when I'm writing sermons or doing other work for the church, I acknowledge that I have questions. Questions I would love to sit down and know the answer to. One of them is why on earth Jesus even brought up this topic. Why talk about what comes next? Why does it matter? It doesn't take a very careful reading of the Gospels in the New Testament to know that a whole lot of people were anticipating and talking about Jesus' second coming. Many of them believed that it was weeks or months away, certainly within their lifetime, after Jesus ascended into heaven. I think there's no question that if you read the works of Paul, that Paul believed Jesus would return in his lifetime. However, here we sit, almost 2,000 years later, we are still waiting. So we exist in the in-between time just exactly like our Jewish brothers and sisters did before us. We know that Jesus has come. We know that our peace with God is possible through Jesus. But we wait. We hope. Sometimes we get lost and wander. Sometimes we despair. So maybe this is the reason Jesus brought this up. Maybe we need a little hope while we wait. Barbara Brown Taylor is one of my favorite theologians who I enjoyed during seminary. And she wrote one of the scripture studies for this text this week. And I want to share with you some of her words. Have you seen those bumper stickers? Warning. In the case of rapture, this car will, the driver of this car will disappear. Have you seen that one? 
There's another one out there that I think is even funnier. When the rapture happens, can I have your car? Matthew, Barbara writes, was not this flippant. But she believes that he firmly set into this second crowd, not concerned with reading the signs or keeping timetables or being preoccupied for when Jesus would come again. I think Matthew thought we had other things to be about. We had other focuses to keep our eyes on. Once the people in that, in that first few centuries of the church figured out that there were 144,000 elect, they didn't have to waste their time anymore on being courteous for those who were not going to heaven. Now, I have to, I have to pose an aside here. I don't believe that that 144,000 number is literal. And there's a reason for that. Number one, there are 7 billion people on this planet. And if any research at all is, is even remotely correct, there were 7 billion people on this planet that have lived so far. So out of uh, 14 billion people, I don't like our odds. <laughs> and worse than that, if you're one of those 144,000 people and you made it into heaven, and then some guy like Billy Graham came along after you, what happened? Did your ticket to heaven get revoked? I don't think Jesus said that. But the people began to focus less on what they ought to be doing and focusing on what was to come next. They got themselves all worked up about this. And Matthew, according to Barbara, found it impossible to refocus them on what they were supposed to be doing. Caring for the widows and orphans. Caring for the hungry. Helping the people that were needed visiting. Helping the people that, needed, that were in jail. Being with the sick. Looking after and tending. Why does it matter if the end is right around the corner? They might have been thinking. Now, let's be clear. That first century church stayed pretty focused for the first 20 or so years, she writes. They still had eyewitness testimony. They still had the disciples who were telling them the stories that they had witnessed. But then those disciples started to die off. Those eyewitnesses started to pass away. And then we end up with second and third hand stories. And the church's fervor cooled. Jesus is so full of love. Why are we still suffering? Why hasn't he come back? This is my favorite quote from this Bible study. Maybe, just maybe, God forgot to set an alarm clock. Or maybe God just forgot totally. these questions in mind. I think that is why Matthew wrote these words down. I think that is why Matthew thought these words were important. I think that's why Jesus shared these words. Because no one knows when. Again, Jesus said, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man himself, only God supposed to do while we wait. 
Are we to be caught up in this fervor of waiting for the next adventure, waiting for the next time that, and I admit it freely, I'm super excited for the day that horn sounds and those gates fly open and my Savior returns. I, I can't even tell you how, how much I'm going to jump for joy. But I'm pretty sure Jesus left us with work to be doing. Left us with instructions that we were supposed to be more than hiding in a corner waiting. That we were supposed to be doing more than sitting first Sunday of Advent, I think it's past time for the church to stop worrying about when Jesus will come again. I think it's past time for us to stop sitting and telling this world what they're doing wrong. I think it's past time for us to get out and get our hands. To follow exactly what Jesus said, just to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. To make the kingdom of God right here, right now. We don't have to wait for Jesus to come again. We must be living out our faith right now. So that's our challenge for this Advent year. Don't sit back and wait. Don't sit back and tick off, well, there's another day Jesus didn't come. It's not about your list. It's not about your patience. (laughs) I think I've told you all this story before. When Sandy and I got married, she said I didn't have the patience of a goldfish. And now... Here we are nearly 20 years later, and she tells me I do, and she's excited. (laughs) I admit freely, I'm an impatient person. But we have to wait. And we are supposed to be about our Father's business as we wait. worrying about when Jesus will come again. Stop worrying about the state of the church today. Stop worrying, period. Start living out your faith together. We must live out our faith together. So when I write the sermon title, Come Lord Jesus, I mean exactly that. Come Lord Jesus, help us to make your kingdom right here, right now. Pour out your spirit in us, through us, And let us make this world a better place in your name. Let us make this world different because of your love. The season of Advent is a reminder that as we wait, Gracious and holy God, we're grateful. Grateful to be in your house today. Grateful to be your children. Grateful that we have the opportunity to live out our faith together. So as we pray today, as we study your scripture today, I pray that you will renew us. Prepare us to be about your business about loving our neighbors. To be about making your kingdom here and now. In the name of your precious and holy Son we pray.